good evening everyone welcome to nizam college my name is parimala kulkarni i'm heading the department of english in this college i'm delighted to have you all here may i first request our author guest mr pratap reddy to come and occupy the chair here and i would like to invite professor usha raman also to come over here yeah we'll welcome them with a big round of applause thank you very much to have you here both nizamians so uh, for those who are not aware both the author as well as the interlocutor are nizamians they are alumni of this college so it's a proud moment for the current nizamians uh, that we have this event here and um, when professor vijay kumar asked me if this could be arranged i immediately agreed and i thought he would be here with us but he has had to uh, leave the country for some uh, reason uh, so obviously uh, i'm a little <coughs> anxious and uh, uh, if there are any inconveniences i really apologize for that because we have had a tough time so um, i welcome you all to this uh, program and uh, nizam college has seen several eminent personalities going out of its portals and we have had the who's who of hyderabad uh, who have studied in nizam college and who have made name nationally and internationally so it is really a proud moment for the people to come back i'm sure many of you also have studied in this college so i'm sure you must be feeling very nostalgic about it in fact we had planned to have the tea in the food court uh, so we thought you would get the feel of your canteen tea and you know your chair the chairs you're sitting on also all these are examination chairs we have so we thought sir wanted particularly i should mention that to for people to have that feel and he said don't bother with anything else but you know just have whatever is there people will come back for the sj hall for nizam college and uh, yeah i i while i was looking at uh, the uh, srinivas rai pol prol trust i realized that uh, 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 srinivas rai plor are also was a nizamian i read that so i'm really delighted ma'am for uh, uh, you know associating with the so we are happy to that we got this opportunity to host this event in the uh, sj hall now may i request uh, professor aparna rai prol to come and introduce the, uh, the author as well as the interlocutor over to you ma'am Thank you very much, Dr. Parimala, for uh, co-hosting this event. And uh, yes, uh, Vijay was very, very excited about this. Also, because Vijay and Pratap apparently are batchmates, and uh, you know that is something that is happening, unfortunately, without him over here. So I, as you said, my father. Uh, known as Rai Prol Srinivas Martandam in some circles, was also a Nizamian, and the Srinivas Rai Prol Literary Trust has not done anything in Nizam College. So I thought, what better opportunity than this in doing this? It's also a very uh, special moment for me personally to introduce uh, the author because pr I've known Pratap Reddy for many, many years, many decades, I should say. Uh, his uh, little sister. was my uh, best friend and we literally grew up together so uh, i'll start by saying he was her very special anna and his uh, what should i say um, caustic humor his reparty his wit turned him into a writer um, pratap reddy was educated at the hyderabad public school nizam college and usmania university son of uh, medical doctors but went far away from medicine and into economics and finance he emigrated to canada in 2002 and currently works for a major insurance company he describes himself as an underwriter by day and a writer by night he writes short stories novels and poems with a focus on the immigrant experience and uh, diaspora of course 
his uh, first book, Weather Permitting and Other Stories, right here, um, was quite a, a big success and uh, was followed by the novel which you see behind him, Ramya's Treasure. Um, that came out in 2016, Weather Permitting was 2014, and Remainder People and Other Stories, his second collection, is going to be out next year in 2024. He's an alumnus of the Humber School of Writers, and he has several grants, also from the Ontario Arts Council, and he has the Best Writer Award from Mississauga Arts Council. He's on the board of directors of Diaspora Dialogues, a non-profit that emerging, you know, supporting emerging writers. Uh, one more thing I would like to say about uh, Ramya's Treasure, that it was nominated for the very best book award for fiction in 2019, and it appeared in, the, in their long list. And uh, there was a beautiful review in the Miramichi Reader, which talks about Pratap's prose as, his, as being very, very beautiful and compelling. Um, so it is indeed a pleasure to have you back at your very own Sala Jang Hall, where you must have done a lot of quizzing, elocution, etc. One year junior to him, I'll start like that, and uh, daughter of a principal of Nizam College, Dr. Pattabhi Raman, is our Usha Raman. Usha, as most of us know, is uh, our colleague at the University of Hyderabad. She's heading the Department of Communication, and she researches mainly in the areas of digital cultures, feminist media studies, children and media, journalism and pedagogy. Usha also has been very, very interested in writing um, for teachers, and we did a recent volume together on gender training for teachers in Hyderabad. She edits a monthly magazine for school teachers called The Teacher Plus and writes for popular media on topics related to education, health, and gender. She's a co-founder of the Fem Lab, an academic activist platform that brings together research and writing on issues related to the future of work and workers. She's an avid podcast listener and until recently wrote several columns for the Hindu, but the latest one was called Peace in a Pod. So over to you both now. I'll use this. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna, and thank you, Parimala, for those um, opening remarks and introductions. Um, it's kind of nostalgic. I don't think I, the last time I was in Salarjung Hall was to write an exam. Um, so this is certainly, yeah, this is certainly a much more pleasant occasion. Um, but as I walked in, I found a lot of the old landmarks had gone. You know, the, the English department that we used to sit on the, uh, you know, on the steps of and uh, is no longer there. Um, and I had to, I don't know if the tree that actually features in Pratap's book um, and uh, which housed or which sheltered the infamous tree gang um, is no longer there or I can't find it. Um, but still, it's, it's wonderful to be back and also to be back particularly talking to uh, Pratap whose um, writing I've um, read earlier as well. We've actually been in conversation several years ago uh, after his first collection came out and uh, uh, so it's, it's, I'm really happy to be, uh, you know, following through with that and to see that he's continuing to write and continuing to explore, um, as Aparna said, the underbelly of the immigrant experience, but also some of the joys. I think it's not entirely um, sad. The stories are not entirely sad, although I think they carry a lot of uh, themes that relate to loss, um, loss of home, loss of relationships, uh, fractured families, but also some of the joys of, for instance, you know, uh, trees in bloom in the northern hemisphere. So, um, so I'd like to start by asking Pratap maybe to talk a little bit about how he found his writing voice, um, you know, 
having been uh, in insurance, in economics, in finance for many years, and then, as Aparna said, you moved in 2002 to Canada, and I'm wondering if it is that move which really, um, you know, triggered the voice. Yeah. Right from my school days, one thing I wanted to be was a writer, you know. For the simplest reason that uh, when I was reading Enid Blyton or later Agatha Christie, uh, the typical writers, Alistair MacLean, Helen McInnes, Desmond Bagley, they had this, they could cast a spell on the reader. For me, they were something like magicians, that they earn money or not, maybe uh, apart from Agatha Christie, you know, oh, okay, at least these guys did was not the most important thing. But how does one become a writer? You know, just by wishing one doesn't become, and I didn't know how to go about doing it. So I started writing, I was, you know, not just insurance and, this, and the finance sound uh, very civilized, you know. I was into uh, base metals, cement, and all kinds of things. And, uh, but this writing was, I would contribute to uh, company magazines, and sometimes to uh, Times of India's Hyderabad, you know, that, uh, that supplement. Oh. So this was that the desire to write was kept alive by coincidence or however it was. But once I moved to Canada, one thing, that it's more structured, you know. So there are writing groups and there are uh, affordable uh, writing, creative writing courses. And uh, when I moved, uh, the first thing, what stimulated me was, as a new immigrant, it was a quite a unexpectedly, like, you know, uh, disturbing experience. You couldn't get a job, uh, daycare is so expensive. You, in your line, you could never get a job in your line. I was in administration and uh, materials, but that I in, ended up in insurance. And uh, if you did get a job, it would be in the night shift, and there were so many things. So I, that's what stimulated me to weave stories around each one of them. You know? And then I started. And then there was this process of uh, trying to sell the book. But this was it, a new experience. It sort of shook me, in, so I could easily start writing about these experiences. The fictional tales is a core being, uh, you know, that an unpleasant truth. Um, so to start off, would you like to read something just to set the tone and get people into, um, or give people a sense of the kind of writing yeah. you do? I'll just read from uh, a short story. It is incidentally one of the first stories I wrote. Because, sorry, sorry. I'll I'll read from a short story. Incidentally, it's one of the early short stories, and. I, it captures, you know, how an immigrant, things have changed. It's not like that what it was 20 years ago. Perhaps if somebody immigrated today, he, they would not feel the same, uh, you know, way my character felt then. So I'll just read out, it was, it's called Going West, and uh, if I may. Going west, when the airplane banked, Toronto's sprawl sprung into view, and I had my first glimpse of the CN Tower, rising like an upended middle finger. The huge butterflies in my stomach were only growing bigger. The aircraft swooped down, and landing with a thud, raced down the runway. But as if having thought better of it, the plane slowed down and eventually came to a stop. Soon afterwards, some of the passengers shot up like jackrabbits and dashed to the exit, clogging the aisles. I waited for that lineup to subside before I got up from my seat and pulled out my hand luggage from the overhead rack. Dragging the bag after me and balancing a rather capacious coat on my arm, I sidled out of the airplane. I clutched the coat, the thickest I could buy in India, as if it were some sort of talisman that would protect me from, the, from Canada's notorious cold. After a long trek through a seemingly endless corridor, I waited in a cavernous hall with a plane load of landed immigrants, men, women, and their cranky children. 
When my number was called out, I entered a small cell, the border official. took my Indian passport and the snot green landing paper and checked every line in them, periodically looking up to examine my face so intently that I half expected him to whip out a pair of handcuffs and slap them around onto my wrists. But he was more interested in the proof of funds I had brought with me. Satisfied with the loot, he said, welcome to Canada. Yeah, in fact, um, you know, that extract, um, I'm sure, is sort of familiar to many people who have traveled and the first time, particularly going to North America, and if you happen to arrive there um, in cold weather, um, the, the sense of dislocation is particularly uh, poignant, I think. Um, but I think you, you join a whole... Um, um, community of diasporic writers who have talked about the immigrant experience in multiple ways, right? Um, but despite that, in India, there is still this sense of going to America as a very romantic notion. It's, it's about going to this land of plenty where your life is going to be uh, comfortable and uh, streamlined and so on. And your stories actually uh, reverse that imagination. And talk about the struggles, not just in terms of emotional struggles, but also the very real day-to-day -day, uh, financial struggles that people go through. And um, just to ask you a little bit about, you know, emigration or migration is an ongoing story. And depending on which decade people have migrated, their experience is very different. Um, and your stories seem to speak to a particular slice of that uh, migration, which is uh, very different in Canada than it is in the United States, for instance. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, just thinking about the whole landscape of diasporic literature, how did you find that particular space that you felt was still ripe for storytelling? As I told you, right, like I call myself, I don't call myself a writer, writer. I'm mostly a person, intuitive, you know. Uh, I react to my environment, whether it is in prose or in uh, poetry. And in fact, uh, some of them said it's a serious handicap because a writer needs to be imaginative, you know, and go, you know, leave the bounds of his uh, neighborhood in either mental space or physical space. So I wanted to, you know, write, uh, record my experiences, you know. That was my intention. And this, and this idea that uh, writing must be, my critic used the word beautiful, that it must be something exceptional, you know, to use the word signalized prose, I would say. So that, only with these two, two things I started to write. But when my colleagues in uh, writing groups or in uh, uh, creative writing courses read, read that, and they were already in Canada for some years, and they, they remarked upon its uniqueness, you know, you know, what they said, when I read your stories, I had forgotten that I have gone through all this, that it's a very nice thing that you're doing, focusing on the new immigrant, you know, who has just landed with so many hopes, coming from uh, India, like a British Commonwealth com company, coming to Canada, both using functionally Indian English here, there, semi-US English, you know, Canada is not, you know, not very Canadian in its English or anything like that. It, there, it is in some ways, but it's such a shock. So it is, so that's how I didn't deliberately, you know, it was not a strategy. So what it turned out, and therefore, not surprisingly, it got me some of these smaller awards, nothing very great like Booker Prize. And also, it won a, you know, manuscript context, you know. That's how I could, it's very hard to be published, either in, India or in uh, Canada, I think, but uh, that's why, because it won that prize, manuscript prize, it was that much easier, you know, to have it published. Yeah. Um, so, you know, moving from the first book to the second, uh, the first, of course, uh, weather permitting and other stories is a series of really short, short stories. I think um, none of them is more than, not more than 10 pages yeah. at the most. Um, and they're all, um, sometimes they leave you, they're very open-ended, 
uh, they're not stories with a resolution necessarily. And I find that's something that I see across your writing, right? It's not about having a plot that has a very clear trajectory and it's neatly tied up at the end, but um, there are lots of questions that are um, left open. Um, and I'm wondering if that is something, again, that's a conscious strategy in your writing or, um, you know, how do you think about that? It is not very conscious, but somehow I liked it, the way I would end. My son, who was only six or seven, he said, the stories are, you know, good, but the ending is terrible, kind of, you see. <laughs> and surprisingly, many in Canada also think so about that ending, leaving it right, and then some of them said, there's so much to develop further. I'm forgetting that uh, it's a short story, but some of them said, you, you know, ratchet up to such interesting level, and then you just leave us high and dry. But maybe it was my love for de fiction, you know, like where the last chapter is not, you know, to, to, until the very last sort of that suspense which the reader enjoys in uh, Agatha Christie or Dorothy Sayers. Perhaps it was that. But the thing most important was my colleague's father is a Spanish writer, refugee from uh, Guatemala. In fact, he has lineage from uh, the guy who wrote. Uh, Man of La Mancha, right? That Don Quixote. Yeah, he's a descendant. He said, because South American writing is supposed to be the finest in fictional landscape, right? He said that your endings are great and this is how they, they should be written. So this lone voice being a descendant of Cervantes and coming from South America, this alone I think is enough, whether it's to my son or general re reading public who thought my Endings are a little too much, kind of. Too little, actually, yeah, too not too rather, much. <laughs> yeah. Too little. Um, so, I mean, in terms of a short story, I think one gets that, right? The form of a short story um, demands that you pack in a lot, but also don't tie it up too neatly for it to be successful. Um, but a novel is, presents a different challenge. And so when you moved from uh, weather permitting and other stories to Ramya's treasure, um, again, the way the novel is written could be a series of short stories. You can read each chapter as a short story and not go any further if you so chose. Um, so how did that transition happen? And, and before you answer, I'd also like you to lead into a reading from Ramya's Treasure, if you don't mind, because um, Ramya's Treasure has a, a lot of going back and forth between the, you know, b between the immigrant experience and growing up in India. And a lot of that growing up happens in Hyderabad. So for those of us in Hyderabad, you know, you find a lot of very familiar tropes. One of them is Nizam College. Um, and um, yeah, so how did that transition from the short story to the novel happen? And would you like to read something yeah. from Ramya's treasure? See, uh, generally my publisher thinks that, you know, unless you are a committed short story writer who never go into fiction, that it's uh, like Alice Munro or somebody, right? They don't write long fiction at all. Ga Mavis Gala, sorry, like Alice Munro or Mavis Gala who only write short fiction. But if you, otherwise you have to develop into, uh, it's as though from short stories, it's kids play, you go into a, a writing novels. That's what generally publishers, you know, they, are think, they have their mind on uh, sales and all that, right? So I, I continue to write short stories and I thought I must think of a, a longer work and very foolhardily, I thought of, without thinking, the most vulnerable immigrant there could be. Somebody coming from the Orient, that is, say, India. And then I thought, a woman. And without even thinking, as I started off a novel with a woman's voice, kind of. And, uh, and as I was writing, and this 
uh, one could call it cheating. Also, there was a person from uh, writing with in very good humor, and that she thought you cheated. You wrote, written a novel which are just a series of short stories, but all held together as a novel. You know, it doesn't. It has all the important ingredients of a novel. It doesn't sacrifice that aspect of a novel. However, they are like uh, stories stitched together, and. Uh, and that's how it was. So it, it was a little easier to write, maybe, because you're only thinking of it, or maybe even difficult. Because on one hand, you have to think of this story having this beginning and end, you know, middle and an end. At the same time, it must fit into the larger trajectory of the novel. So they all fall into place, right? It was so much, maybe, but I, I enjoyed writing. So that is it. And uh, this is about that woman's voice, right? There are two things. I, I told you my manuscript won an award, right? So the, the prize was that they would give an established writer to mentor my, my book. So there was this person and it was long distance. So I'd send, I would send these uh, stories periodically and many of them went where about strong female characters. But when the first story went, which had a, around a man, she was stunned. She knew this, she had thought a woman had, was writing all those stories. That this a woman, because being a woman, this a woman could not have written this story. And that's how, and that gave me that confidence, you know, that she didn't know because for her, she is uh, Cynthia Holes, a very famous writer in, uh, in Toronto, that Pratap Reddy is a man's name, you know. So then, then she said, are you a man or a woman? So, so that gave me that the writing, you know, is very, it can sell to a woman. And then after that, after the novel was completed and it's going to be published, it was already sold to a publisher, my publisher. I got cold feet, what kind of reviews I'll get, you know, because sometimes people might not write a man being in a woman's, you know, it's, it happens, right? If you're this, you shouldn't write, if you're a white, you shouldn't write about a black. It's becoming more and more segmented, these silos. Then I sent it to another writer, her, her uh, blurb is there at the back, called Farzana Doctor, you know. Just read it and see, does it, you know, pass muster kind of. She said, she read it, she enjoyed and said it works kind of, you know, like that. So many people who read it don't know that it's written, you know, in Canada they won't know. Pratap is a, like Jennifer doesn't end with a vowel, you know how it is, right? I'll, uh, whatever his name, so they think it's sometimes they're written by a man or a woman, sorry, yeah. Um, so would you like to yeah, read yeah. something from, uh, yeah, from like your read. station? from Ramya's treasure. Ramya left for her new college on the opening day with expectations tinged with nervous station, nervousness. Instead of sending her on her way on her own by RTC bus, her father took the morning off to drop her off at the college. The college had, had old imposing buildings in a confused yet charming mixture of colonial and Indo-Sarsenic styles. The almost rundown structures shared their age and gov government's apathetic maintenance. Nonetheless, as a college, it had a casual and informal air, almost festive, and promised to be a fun place. The students, old and new, were wandering around free of any care or responsibilities in the world. It was all very difficult different from her idea of school. The unfettered freedom that was thrust on her was dizzying at first, without the guide rails of, a, of rigid rules and the supervisory, all-seeing, big sisterly eye of her old school, that is. All this seem, seemingly convivial mixing of boys and girls was also a bit too much. When she spotted her long-lost friend, Maunika, during the lunch hour, she was delighted to discover someone she thought she was a kindred spirit. Apart from showing an exaggerated amazement at reconnecting with Ramya, Maunika, going by the name Monica now, 
was cool and composed and looked very much at home in this large co-ed institution. In the very first month of the academic year, the senior students hosted a party for the freshers, as the first year students were known. At the party, they served light snacks on flimsy paper plates and tea and coffee in small glass tumblers. Things have changed, huh? The, the, real crowd, the real crowd pleaser was a mock beauty contest. Which seemed to evoke a great deal of merriment. The, award, the awards meant to poke fun at the freshers went mostly to girls. A student with spots on her face got the Miss Clarezel Award. A hirsute won the Miss Hairy Legs and a well-built girl the ultimate title of Mr. India. Ramya had, had goosebumps as the program progressed. When it was finally over, like many other first-year first year girls, she sighed with relief, glad that she hadn't been selected for some belittling title or the other. After that, there was much music and dancing. Only a handful of the newcomers were bold enough to dance in full view of the college. Ramya sat with a group of her classmates watching. But Monica was on the dance floor, having a whale of time as she flounced around with a roly-poly senior Ramya didn't know. From time to time, Monica looked at in Ramya's direction and bade her to come, to, come on to the floor. A horrified Ramya shook her head vigorously. When the pair got tired, they came over to Ramya's group and sat down on the vacant chairs amidst them. Monica seemed happy as a lark and was very voluble. Sweat poured down the rotund face of her dance partner. Soon another young man, ostensibly a senior, joined them. Hi, Prahlad, Monica's friend said. Hi, Amar, he said, his eyes scanning the group. The gaze hovered briefly over Monica before moving on. It paused over another girl before coming back to the rest to rest on Ramya as if for good. Ramya looked away quickly. When then the DJ, one of the seniors, enjoying the chance to show off, changed the track to a song with a fast tempo. Monica squealed, my favorite number. Let's dance, her friend said, rising from the metal folding chair, which grunted back into shape. Would you care for a dance? The man named Prahlad asked. Ramya turned to say no curtly, but no words came out. She hadn't realized how good looking he was, with the clean cut features and light brown eyes and a day's stubble giving him a rakish appeal. Yet she saw no reason to dance with a stranger just because he was handsome. Luckily for her, Monica tugged at her hand, saying, Come along. Just to escape Prahlad's attention, Ramya got up and went along with Monica to the dance floor. Once on the dance floor, Monica whirled away with her partner, cutting Ramya adrift. Ramya stood alone in the middle of the floor, like a no-man of a sundial, not knowing what to do amid wildly gyrating bodies careening all around her. Stop here. In a way, it is a symbol of Ramya. I didn't know when I was writing, but you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have very clear memories of that kind of ragging and, you know, being paraded in front of the seniors. So maybe it was your batch that was doing that to my batch. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, I mean, so Ramya's journey, uh, you know, is from Hyderabad to Canada and in many ways, like you said, is um, what now many people are talking about and researching, uh, not so much in the c context of Canada, but in the US where a lot of H4 wives who are very well qualified but go on a spousal visa, cannot work, and therefore um, there's a particular kind of trauma that they undergo. Uh, which is very different from the sort of trauma or adjustment, if you want to call it, that someone like Ramya would have undergone. And I'm wondering if, um, you know, uh, you've thought about that aspect of uh, settling in uh, for a woman, specifically. Uh, 
Like uh, in many ways, you know, Canada is different. They are neighbors, but different from USA. So this uh, business of H4, we, you know, you don't have that uh, problem in Canada. So as I told you, I react to my environment, right? So I don't know the ins and outs of it. Perhaps one, if I, all of you will buy my books and I become a bestseller writer and I need to crank out book after the book, then uh, maybe I will, you know, choose different uh, areas of the world or uh, situations and then do research like many writers do beforehand. You know, they have sometimes many of these writers take up a topic, do a lot of research as they are going along, they incorporate the findings of their research. I do it the other way around as of now. So, so I don't know much about H4. Though I know my wife's, uh, you know, like friends who are in, U, you know, USA having that problem and uh, sometimes they're always looking for means to co come to Canada because there all these, there are many problems in the USA. Canada has a different set of uh, problems. It's not as easy to find a job because it's not such a big economy. Say now there are 40 million people. When I went, there were 33 million people in the second largest country in the world. They wouldn't recognize your uh, credentials, your university degrees, your work experience. And uh, so it was very, but one thing was, women, it was easier to find jobs. You know, that is what it is in Canada. So. Uh, in fact, when you can need, uh, new immigrants come, I would tell them instead of you just you know ask your wife to look around. You know she will land. It will be an entry level job, but at least it will keep your home fires. You know and you can you know you will get that breathing space to look for a better job, or you know you have that time. So slightly it's different. You know as I said, Canada has healthcare and you know cheaper education. So it's in a way different, possibly because. It has Quebec, you know. Left to the other parts of Canada, they would want to integrate with the USA. For them, USA, that English speaking is. But Quebec, you know, it uh, sort of marches to a different drummer, you know. It takes cues from Europe. So therefore, we have this Quebec sort of, you know, restraining. So the problems are different. In pro here, even if you get a reasonably good job, the taxation, it's sort of... So you don't seem to go away from that, you know, that you'd never get that you have stuck riches in Canada, you know. It's a land of opportunity, milk and honey, you know, in USA can give you, if you could land a very good job, the taxes are lower maybe and all that, so it could. But in Canada, you never get that feeling. Though it has got good health care and a pension and all those things, you never feel that because... Uh, before, you know, you start and you start earning 80,000, you start paying 40% tax. So you can imagine we have to make do with it. So you don't get that feeling. Canada has its own problems. And I could write another novel, which is not set in Canada, my next novel. But there are enough problems then for me to look into, you know, Just the predicament of yeah, what's happening. Or, yeah. um, which brings me to another theme that sort of runs through in both books, which is that of loss. And this is loss of home, in a sense, or loss of relationships um, and I'm wondering and and I know that your forthcoming uh, collection dwells on this to some extent and again it's a problem that a lot of migrants face which is you go for certain opportunities but you leave something behind and what you leave behind is of course partly culture partly the physical material nature of home but it's also parents very often and elderly parents and um, you know, then what do you do when they get to a stage when they need care? So this is something that um, sort of features a little bit in both of the earlier books, but I understand you're going to be talking more about it later. So do you want to talk a little bit about generally the theme of loss, both in terms of home and, um, you know, family ties? Yeah, I'd like to address both these issues, partly separately and then together kind of, you know. I think in Ramya's case, she seems to have lost more than anybody else in the history of humanity, you know, if you have read this book. But, uh, but then she, uh, though it is a spoiler, but she overcomes it all. But besides that, you know, loss, I think, 
is an inevitable part of life. Like as Buddha would say, you know, I would think coping with loss, everybody feels at different levels at, you know, and the impact is greater or smaller. Perhaps we're, it's good that people don't focus so much and they move on. Uh, but maybe a writer dwells a lot on the loss, you know, because it's an integral part of loss, coping with it. And writing gives us space or a platform to cope with our losses, you know, so we can write about it. So that, uh, so I, I think loss is inevitable, it's inherent. Everybody feels, you know, like childhood, maybe sometimes losing siblings or your gra loved grand parent or you know how it happens it's a continuous thing but one good thing is that we have learned to move on not forcing focusing too much on it and uh, so that is it in uh, in case of Ramya too so this is what I wanted to like she feels alone in the world and each of these chapters shows the relationships she has built and then how it comes to naught you know many of them in the first and the most one up front is with her husband. That's how the novel begins, right? She has separated from her husband. And like it happens so often in North America, just before Christmas she's laid off. And then that is how she begins, the, the novel begins and then how it uh, unfolds the novel. So loss, as I said, is inevitable and then, you know, so I come to terms with it in my writing. Um, and what about the second kind of, maybe not so much loss as anxiety, um, in terms of which you're dealing with in the forthcoming novel, uh, oh, Remainder. True, that's true. Yeah, Remainder. Yeah, because there, yeah. See, when I first wrote this book, right, it is all about one side uh, of immigration. But then, or is it being a writer or whatever, but there's the other side to immigration too. And some of my writer colleagues in Canada were surprised that there exists such a world that, you know, she said, published writer, head of this famous institution and all that. She said, I'm amazed that these, there are these things, immigration is very big for them and uh, her organization is funded by uh, groups which uh, deal with immigrants. You know. But she didn't know that, you know, that there are other aspects to immigration. So this, many of the stories, not all, in this story is called Remainder People and other stories, they deal with what happens, you know, to the families that are left behind. Like my parents were empty nesters. There's somebody else taking care of them. And what is their life? Say about 50 years ago, it was very different. It was all about children growing up, getting married, grandchildren, and how attached we were to our grandparents, you know, like the grandparents loved us more than our parents did. Uh, sorry. Uh, it's about how, you know, like uh, earlier it was different with generations living in the same neighborhood, perhaps uh, the same house. But now, uh, empty nesters, somebody else taking care of uh, old age homes or some fancy place because money can buy, but not having those, you know, the simple joys of having your grandchildren around you or that, that kind of things. So that's what I did in Remainded People, you know, about of how a young man living in USA, obvious, sorry, living in India, obviously not having the resource to go abroad maybe, gets this opportunity to go and take care of his friend's father, who is living alone, living in Jubilee Hills kind of, you know, well-heeled, but having, you know, only servants to look after him. So this boy goes with an eye on the main chance, you know. So, and the, the father describes himself as, because he used to love books, and the word remainder is used in book trade for books that don't sell. You know, if you go and you found in a box, they find cheap, two rupees or whatever, here it might be 50 rupees, there it will be one dollar or something, they, sorry, they sell. So like he says, we are remainder people, you know, nobody wants, so it's there for anybody to come and take for asking. So I had that kind of, uh, there was another story which is my favorite, is about uh, 
It, see, one problem with Canada is they won't give visas easily. So they bring their older parents as long-term uh, uh, residents. So they are not covered by health care. So an old lady comes with her uh, adult son, and her problem's there, you know, and not able to get health care. And uh, there's both the entire family has to deal with her uh, mental issue kind of, right? I called it Sweet Memories, and that's the opening story in that uh, collection. It's a very poignant one, and uh, so, and all of them have a germ of truth, you know. I've seen some things happening like this, so that small grain of truth, right, in a, uh, in a writer's absolutely, what do you call, uh, if I may say, criminal inventive mind, right? It grows slowly, the crystal grows and forms into a story and, you know, a piece of fiction. So that's how it is, yeah. Um, yeah, so I know that you've also written some poetry and um, you did say that you would like to read from um, a couple yeah. of those. So would you like to do that? Yeah, if there, if there is time, I, I would like to. I think we can to. maybe do that and yeah. then open it up for yeah. questions. Okay. Yeah. And before I start, uh, reading from my poetry. Often I am called, you know, like poetry, uh, they have right all these uh, poetry meets and uh, po uh, th this kind of writers uh, meeting. There I clearly tell myself, I write poetry, but I'm not a poet. <laughs> so with that, uh, uh, yeah, we have it. And why I started writing? Because my mother used to dabble in, though she was a surgeon, she would dabble in poetry, but I could recognize a sensibility, a, you know, something very fine uh, uh, aspect where which she, you know, distills the, info, whatever it is, that inputs, right, to bring out this, this lovely, light, aesthetic uh, output, right, this creation. So I never thought as a man I had this faculty at all. But when I was, I told you it's so hard to get published, getting some rejection slip or magazines never respond. And then I asked, you know, I was this, I had written so many stories, book length, but I'm not getting published. So one of them said, uh, Mrs. Agat's Council runs an open mic, you know, where uh, people could come and uh, read. So I called them. And they said, fiction, you can't read fiction in, uh, you know, <laughs> open mic. You can have poems or songs or you can even make m music with your mouth, but fiction, no. Then she said, why don't you write a poem? It was Friday and they're having it on Monday evening, poem. So I wanted so much to be published in that way, you know, somebody to listen to my uh, writing. So I write a, wrote a poem. And with this idea that modern poetry doesn't have to have no iambic pentameter or hexameter or sonnet. So you can just write and wherever you want, you can break. So I wrote a poem and you see, I wanted to be published and I went and read that about a fiction writer compelled to become a poet. They liked it so much and they print, Mississauga Council printed it in their bulletin. So see how I got published without going. That's how it was and then I started writing, you know, now and then poems. And then I thought I will just write because if you're in Canada, you have to write about Canadian winter. So I'll write a, a poem about a poem about Canadian winter. Okay. Pink snow. That year, winter lingered well into May. Close, there's a closer. Okay, sorry, I'll start again. Pink snow. That year, winter lingered well into May, with snow clinging to rooftops and overstaying on sidewalks. The park was cold and unsmiling, birds refusing to sing. The naked trees closed ranks, trembling in the wind. The gray and rumpled sky overhead like an unwashed hoodie, and the ground soft and sodden with last night's needle-sharp rain. When the trail turned, all of a sudden, blindsiding me was a mystical vision.
drifts and drifts of pink snow. Two gaunt crabapple trees standing on a rise had shed all their flowers to make an eider down of petals to warm the shivering earth. There, I think. Um, so was this the poem that you talked about? Do you have that one as well? The one that you read? First, you mean? Yeah. No, it was, it was very long. I didn't want to... Okay. Okay. It's one of my longer poems, so I, you know, I just thought I'd bring something short, easily digestible, doesn't bore them. They don't start looking at the exit or their <laughs> wristwatch. So, as I said, my mother was a poet monkey, right? So this poem I wrote very recently, and it's called Mother's Touch. My God, it's, the print is so small, I hope I'll be able to read it. Mother's touch. My mother detested tall, fat vases, with a crowd of blooms mushrooming in a paroxysm of floral exuberance. She favored slender containers made of marble or four jade, believing in economy of elegance. A sprig topped by a pom-pom-like blossom would rise in serene if solitary splendor echoing mom's motto of less is more. Much water has flowed in the Ganges since the day my mother passed on. Moving on, I settled in the land of the maple. Once shopping in a big box store in the suburbs, I snapped up a very, very pretty terracotta vase in earthy hues and sporting a rustic look. Not svelte, it resembled a flagon with a more than generous girth, much like my mom, who was no, was no twiggy. I also snagged a small plastic bouquet and snipped away the unwanted foliage until only a flower and a triad of leaves remained. I set up the ensemble in the living room, lovely but dead, worse, it was never alive, yet somehow it lends a mother's touch to my dwelling. So, shall we open it up for questions from the audience? Yeah. I if think, anyone yeah. has anything to ask. If you don't have, I'll read from another poem. I'm warning <laughs> you, I'll show you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I... Oh my God. Sorry, I didn't read your book. Uh, I'm... Uh, don't, don't. But anyway, I... Don't, you are my prospective customer. Don't feel so much. Yeah, <laughs> one, one, question, one question, one question. I wanted daughters. to know how you picked that name, Ramya. Actually, there also I made... One thing, I wanted a short name, you know. Yeah. I Still. didn't realize Ramya had two syllables. And they're going to say Ramya in Canada. You know, it needs a lot of... There, I just wanted a sh short name. So that... Why, why know, Ramya? Short, oh, you have so some, many names. some names, but some you know, many of them are used in my short stories, right? So yeah. I didn't have that many. Yes, I was trying to get to that basically. Oh, no. no, 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 that's what I'm not. I'm a very smart writer, but not that smart, I'm guessing, <laughs> to understand your question. <laughs> thank but, you, yeah, thank you. That was pretty deep, yeah. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah, there. Uh, before uh, before you start, a little bird told me that the more questions people ask, they are going to get an autographed copy of my book. So, and also I want to tell you all, I, uh, the organizers told me to see if it's available in India and Amazon. I did and they are available, but the price is 2500 for each of my books. So, ask questions, it's much cheaper. <laughs> <coughs> No. So, yeah, whatever. But still, you can try. Yeah, your luck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I have uh, greatly enjoyed reading uh, both of your books, Pratap. And uh, this is a follow-up question to what uh, was just asked about why do you choose Ramya as a name? And you said it's a short name. So how come you chose Mrs. Bhutalingam? What is it? How did you choose the name Mrs. Bhutalingam? <laughs> 
which is ah, that's short. again for okay. oh, that's very good that's again for that comic effect i had chosen i hope there is no bhuta lingam or uh, sorry it is just not good very good on a writer's part but you know in that story i just wanted to show that that and she looked mrs bhuta lingam right amazon like figure cut and dry i don't know if you all have read that so anybody you know no nonsense kind of if i had to give a name looking at the character <laughs> it would be mrs bhuta lingam yeah that's it yeah true yeah please go ahead yeah but i'd like to ask a little about your writing process you said you usually react to things so uh, and you like to record your experiences so um, would you keep a journal or a diary and that would transfer into your writing how would you go about it no i'm unfortunately i don't have this right of maintaining a journal or a diary or but sometimes if i get a good idea right but it doesn't happen very often now i started doing it again because i'm putting together a book of poems so you know you can't simply sit down and expect poems to just come into your head sort of right if anything occurs to me in a airport lounge or walking then i carry a book and just quickly i, I do now but uh, otherwise i don't because there are many good ideas which have gone down the drain and said what was that idea i got wa walking to work from you know like in, then it, i don't do that but i remember right so i think uh, these experiences are ingrained into you because you are living it right because that one thing good about somebody told me about my stories are that they are lived experiences right so they are so much more convincing because it has the ring of truth though it's fiction yeah Yeah yes Yeah you can take No uh Pratap uh, given the price of your books in India uh I mean it does look like uh, the primary audience is Canadian I mean having you know made Canada home for so many years and you are interacting with the Canadian literary community uh, and so on uh and i'm sure uh, the native canadians or uh, you know those who have been there uh, for a long time white canadians and so on have certain expectations uh, of immigrant experiences they want to hear certain kinds of stories certain kinds of narratives uh, how do you negotiate with those expectations and uh, you know what i mean i mean it could be stereotypes but it could also be certain uh expectations yeah. of certain kind of experiences yeah uh, one thing you know uh, as of now at least i have that artistic integrity that what the reader thinks you know like whoever my that cr white cross section has never been and also especially because they give so many grants right there is an expectation and many of them call my stories dark yeah it's because i think i'm shaking the chair uh, is an, may, they don't like this idea that i'm showing immigrants going through that these real problems you know the government wants everybody to feel that you come here and you have a new fantastic life so that is a big problem especially when it comes to grants so you know i'm sure they think about it uh, uh, these these stories are so there is that but as of now uh, i don't write so that somebody is pleased about it these are just outpourings of it you know and this i had long long ago in india the way i wrote my exams or this or that take it or leave it kind of thing that's it is the way i work every day also in my day. this is the way i do i mean you know <laughs> absolutely impervious to you know boss's way of saying do it this way or that way or something like under writing it should be done this like writing also i think should be some of you who know me well i think not in uh, yeah that is so i have so, uh, that, so yeah couple of questions one is how much did uh, those creative writing uh, uh, courses really help you uh, and the second one is about how much does mentoring when you're writing really help you yeah one can you know uh, this creative the, the reason i started joining or whatever is that you know 
by coincidence the very first short story was published you know actually but it was in a glossy indian immigrant magazine you know and uh, there it's very different it was almost like quarter pound not semi pound like that kind of magazine published and it was that same story uh, mrs bootalingam you know it had it suited their purpose it was a very new magazine and then it had all this Uh, implied adultery and all that kind of thing right so it, it suited there after that i had problem you know all this started and then i didn't want to go back i was uh, writing a quiz column for them so but not to publish again that story you know even the uh, perfume they would advertise back of a glossy nothing you have seen here or you will see in america if you go as so glossy you won't believe it uh, even that uh, perfume will have that the name was sexual it was that kind of a magazine and uh, that so but the editor was because she would call me for them the fantastic dues every year right they will have this big party and I was a regular contributor for their quiz so i would go and i asked her how do i become a writer then she said first try to become a member of a, the writers community start so that's why i started finding or joining book clubs joining uh, creative writing courses and this and you come to know people their struggles and they help you there you know all kinds of things that's how it started creative writing is a throw of dice you know? how how you react to it some people we went to the same some smaller ones one person a very good friend she said she learned nothing but i found that you know it's like what shakespeare said you know i don't know if i can get the right right that uh trees have tongues there are ser- sermons in stones right trees have tongues there are sermons in stone brooks have something that is that in nature you know there are so many things that can instruct you depends on what you pull out right so my first creative writing from humber school for writers I had two fantastic mentor elizabeth hawa this was that old you know great writer and very good input she told me don't write sh- short stories you have got such you know you can expand one of these and uh, make it a novel you they don't publish short stories so i went through that hardship of not uh, and then after that this creative writing school pretty expensive had uh, they have a in house uh, agent you know she, the same thing she sent out to professional readers it came back like a song of praise but she says i can't sell short stories so both ways see that one had a great mentor and then uh, it didn't work you know then i had to start sending on my own and when i won the diaspora dialogue awards you know more more publishers were interested so it's like that fundamentally what you can extract from it that's the most important thing you know yeah. anybody else yeah 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 please go ahead yeah. uh, my name is sudhakar uh, belong to your same batch 76 to 79 nizam college thank you for coming um i'm going to make a statement not a question i'm fully inspired that even a social science student could become a writer because i always used to think someone who's done their english literature or someone you know uh, who's good in their uh, writing skills right from their childhood maybe could evolve themselves into a good writer but then hearing you and uh, looking at the uh, reading the synopsis of your book also in fact i thought i will also start writing you should thank you uh, i'd like to actually it was not a statement but there are so many things a author can uh, you know shed light on first thing is you must write everybody has an artist in them and you don't have to write like you don't have to write like any author you admire you should write with your own voice don't be your own critic i always tell them why do you why are you your own critic those damn people who don't write they are getting money to critic yours why are you doing their job don't don't be your own critic write with your own voice what you want to write and one more thing about do have uh, in ramya's treasure in nizam college i skipped i speak about that english department too because of you know to make it condensed and uh, i had very we had very inspiring i can i still remember their names Shanti Kapana, which comes first. Sayyad, Bala Kodanda Raman. Not only literature, but quiz also. High priestess of quiz. How how inspiring they were. This is Jafri, you know, like uh, so. All these things did contribute to me. And again, I want to tell. I'm sorry. 
if you are you are pedagogic in your writing right in canada you will never get published i saw some peers in you know like in that if you write like this the they are called acquisition editors you know she said i don't understand half the things you are saying and you, you know it can happen so is best and all to tell you know if i think back uh, who were your favorite writers you say agatha christie she didn't even go to school you will think of uh, somebody called josephine tay we had her play she used to write as gordon david if you remember we had her play remember caesar she used to write brilliant detective stories you know and that play she was a gym teacher you know she was uh, so they are like this you know the writers are not alistair maclean who was in the navy and uh, writers are not confined by like heming hemingway was a journalist right so it's not important but if you can one thing one thing about doing ma or something is it gives you whole range of writers right great writers but if you can imbibe something from them so much the better but don't imitate them that's what i would say pratap uh, this is omshekar i happen to be in between pratap and rusharam in this college uh, in fact you started answering my question you know what is the kind of impact and how much has nizam college had on your uh, writing you know the tamarind tree or you know the cellar jung hall where we had a lot of uh, you know competitions and so on that is number yeah. one the second uh, do you have the luxury of being you know a writer for writing say you know if i see something i am excited therefore i write and uh, is it a um, something where you can really make money mm-hmm. or an impact you know what are you looking for if you look at contemporary writing journalist writing in india mm-hmm. we are writing as the demand goes and you know the more you write the more you make money it's yeah. not what i like but what the reader wants so is this kind yeah, of I writing will. good in canada yeah. is too i will there are two questions so those who are like you know he'll have two entries in the the hat right so first one is impact of uh, this quiz contest and all. actually writing and quiz are in some ways both get that ins- from books right and uh, so because i used to read a lot of books i was so much you know i was good in quizzing so but that the residue was there you know of reading all these books and one day it rubbed off on me and wanting to be a writer so there is a connection i read a lot and then it helps me in my in, on all those quiz competitions i won and i won even later life for tatas and all that i won the brand equity so it has a relationship you know the kind of friends you move around with the kind of friends i made in nizam college they still are my very good friends so it does have an impact your college life your colleagues does have an impact on your your future life and and writing too because uh, that love for the language right which you develop it was so in public school also they gave lot of importance to reading and all that here too in nizam college we had this fantastic english department so it has an impact about this uh, the difference i make why i don't call is that see i could be skillful i used to write for a corporate and this and that but that i call a, a, a like any writer you know you, you have this writing skills so you can just about write anything so you know, i didn't want to be like that you know because uh, it just happened i wanted to so you can write about anything right you can write so i didn't want to be like that so do something like because i want to become a writer so become a journal- journalist because you can write it was for me would you want a journalist life no whatever it is so that is also an important not just because i can write so that's how but this was easy way right join coromandel uh, so whatever dad's influence join fantastic company you know what joy it was to work, to tear myself away it is easier to tear away from your spouse than to tear away from he will he will tell you to from coromandel but i did i first resigned without a job came so you know like it was i took this corporate culture and went no regrets because there simply life right that's what is bristling with life you are getting this inputs 
you're collecting raw material as you go. Maybe one day I will uh, write a book on my Kuramandal experience. I have a title already. It's called Holy Smoke. You remember that yagna they did in Kuramandal? <laughs> that maybe I'll write about it. Who knows if I live long enough. But life is whole experiences, right? And so to that second question about uh, it has its own, it suddenly descends on you. And this recently, in uh, one of our poetry associations, one uh, lady commented, it's not about poe thinking of poems, poems descend on you. And I thought how true it was. It's, it occurs to you suddenly. If you sit somewhere and keep looking at things, you can always, you know, sort of rustle up something. You can always put it into words, but it'll have, it'll lack that sequa, right? That's something that makes it uh, literary, like, you know. So I think it, when you walk around, it just occurs to you, okay, I'd like to write about this, you know. That's it. So when I react, I can't just go to a place, I'll sit down, see, and think I'm going to react and something is going to, it won't. Maybe a line from my favorite writer, Graham Greene. You know, something will trigger off. But my inspiration, I'll tell you, I'll see. I'm a writer in many ways than, you know, despite my seemingly working in corporate circles and all, I'm a recluse, I love books, I write in isolation. And how do I come to know? I actually, many of these things my wife brings me. She was there working in Canada and she would come and tell me something. And then that's where that germ of an idea, right? That first crystal is dropped. And when they read, right? And she says, this is, I gave you this idea, didn't I? And many times, to such an extent, when I keep reading, that's how life is, writer's life. I have this story, if you all have read. If somebody has read, it's called a Mango Fool, right? Actually, here there are two inspirations. The first was a line from Graham Greene, the, sentence, the phrase, ugly customer. That was the original title. She is an ugly customer, but I made it more. Uh, so th with that, I developed the story. But what would I write about? The things my wife tells me, because she was working in a shop called Winners, you know. So I described that in the story, and it has a little unbelievable ending, <laughs> my wife thinks. But I wanted to bring that. <laughs> However, so and when I was reading from the story, somebody came and asked me, did you work in a retail? I said, I didn't, but my wife did. <laughs> it is enough for a writer. You know, there you are. So that's how, you know, writing is. I think we have one last question here. Yeah. Sir, as you said, your next novel is on the lives of and the situations of Canada. Are you going ah, to... Next, yeah. Are uh, you going to write about our nation too? Yes. My forthcoming novel, I started writing with so much. Uh, it's called, it's as nice, only, you know, sometimes, you know, if the writer writes something, right, the public, the critics never like it. I love the title, so I don't know what's going to the fate of the book. It is Ramya's Treasure was my first book set in Canada. And the, it, this is called Praful's Errands, you know. So I love the title, and I came up to fourth or fifth chapter, then COVID and uh, writing from home, working from home, I'm still working from home, I didn't, I just couldn't get around. It, uh, in the process, I think my manuscript got COVID, it's a long haul COVID, I'm waiting for inspiration to restart, you know, this character, Praful's uh, adventures, and it is set in India. So actually, sometimes I'm thinking if it wants to be published, somehow I must bring in a Canadian or something like that, might not. If I find a publisher, you know, it depends. So as of now, it is set in India. This is like a con man called Praful and the things, you know. And uh, yeah, I'll stop there. I have so many other, yeah. So it's going to be set in India. Keep our fingers crossed. You also pray for me so that Praful and the book recover and they know, they, yeah, it comes out sooner or later. So I think we'll have to stop there. Uh, we've run out of time. Uh, but thank you, Pratap, for reading and for speaking to us. And thank you all for your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to give the book now? Uh, I think uh, we have about six, seven people who have asked questions. So those who ask questions, can you 
Did you collect the chits? Uh, did I, I ask you? No? No? Can you, uh, can one of you quickly pre prepare one, two, six uh, chits? Without names, just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. No, while well, the time they'll uh, pick out the numbers and everything. Yeah, they're doing it. There are six people. Like one, two, three, four, five. Yes. Number one. Yeah, number one. One second. One, two, three, four, five. Six and that lady, seven. Eight. There are eight chits we need. Not Shravan. <laughs> you forget I am standing here. Okay. Uh, make eight uh, numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and give it to the author. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, while they're doing that, while. <laughs> okay. Okay, while the chits are being ready and the draw will be uh, drawn, um, let me just uh, formally propose a vote of thanks. We had uh, a nice cloudy evening, chai, samosa, and a nice chai pe charcha kind of a thing we had, a real fireside chat because there are oodles of nostalgia here. In the books, in the Nizamians, on the days and off the days, there is so much of nostalgia going around here. It was a wonderful chat. Initially, I was wondering, you know, there are two books. Oh my God, how are we going to finish uh, in one hour? But then, Usha, our quintessential interlocutor, who very skillfully handles these things, did it beautifully. <laughs> Drawing out Pratap, right from his first uh, inspiration, Tell his future books, his uh, migrant experiences, his creative writing experiences, and the nostalgia of uh, uh, Hyderabad. Everything she drew out, and he patiently went over all of it, and he also patiently answered all the questions. To both of you for making this evening very enjoyable. Thank you very, very much. And for all of you who came here and also competed for the questions. <laughs> but it was a nice, uh, delightful evening that we all had in very good uh, company and good discussion. Uh, I'm really delighted that the Srinivas Rayapur Trust. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, one second, one second. Once again, I'm coming to that. <laughs> I'm delighted on behalf of the Srinivas Rayapur Trust, the Department of English, Nizam College and the Hyderabad Literary Festival that we have come together to organize this um, event. And we are also happy with the response that we got for this event. Thank you very, very much for making it so interactive and so nice. Thank you very much.